the paleontologist argued that they've been asleep forever. Snoozing for eons in jungle canopy, their crested heads tucked out of sight behind waterfalls, sediments and fossils caked thick along their tails. She believed cults of underground hominids worshipped the stillness of the chameleon's ornate horns, prayed to their clasped feet framed by archways of volcanic rock. Her theories were based off evidence acquired on the front lines. The nanocrystal structures these chameleons use for color change can also organize into armor kind of holographic geometry, some sort of transcendental barrier, one that protected them from the undersea grinding of tectonic plates, shielding their unconscious faces from the calving of glaciers, lava flows, fingers of gamma radiation sweeping across the planet like shafts of light in an empty ballroom. But I think the paleontologists got it wrong. See, they were never asleep at all. The chameleons balanced on bloodstained coliseums to sniff at gladiators and tiger entrails. They lined Permian lagoons with jaw-sifting sea life orchestrating mass extinction and evolution. They've been perched atop giant donut signs, observing family dynamics, your mother scolding you for your report card and the way you smear chocolate on your face. You can hear them lapping from your filthy neighborhood pond, smell their dune-draped excrement on a desert highway. I've seen this. An immense conical eye swiveled at your bedroom window. Scaled rings telescoping underneath your sheets, peering ever beyond sex and dreams. Great Chameleon War, 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 a surreal audio drama, rated M for Mature. Listening may induce the following side effects. Spontaneous limb regeneration, dreams of ancient reptiles baying at the sun. Also, the sudden urge to run naked into the desert until your body becomes sand. This is episode one, The Whaler, Side A. It's day 237 of my tour in the Great Chameleon War, and I've found a pterodactyl in the trench mud. A plastic trinket. Purple. Spread wings. Something that'd be traded for a few cupcakes at school. Maybe start a fistfight during recess. It's the same model as the pterodactyl toy I had as a kid. The same one I lost on the day my dog died. 
the one that fell out of my pocket as I struggled through tidal mud and set Lamy's stiff Labrador body out into the marshes near my neighborhood, just past the causeway with its whirlpools and the ditches lined with fiddler crabs, dumb herons, and one time, a dead dolphin. Strangely enough, the shirt underneath my fatigue jacket features a pterodactyl cawing through a blue sky. In its talons, a ninja turtle, Leonardo specifically, flailing with his twin swords in midair. To cope inside the nesting zone, it's necessary to craft your own fictions. Egocentric tales with you at the center of the whole fucking war that let you stumble headlong into delusion and never look back. Staying sane isn't an option here. So, I take the pterodactyl as a sign. Good luck? Bad luck? I don't really care. I tuck the dinosaur snug into the exterior webbing of my helmet. The toy looks cool there. It'll make newcomers to the nesting zone pause upon seeing me, even for just a moment. They will wonder about the avian reptile, which, if needed, will give me enough time to kill them. Kill them with my sword, of course, to make Leonardo proud. See, there was something about Leo that set him apart from the other Ninja Turtles. A certain aura about his choice of weapon. Nunchaku and prong daggers and bow staffs can all kill you. Sure. But a sword? A sword speaks of something deeper as a weapon. As an idea. It embodies the characteristic that would make Leonardo stop at a country road where a smaller, less intelligent box turtle struggled to cross. Only Leonardo wouldn't place his cousin safely in the grass past the guardrails. No, no, no. He'd place that turtle gentle in his mouth, and with those broad, flat teeth of his, crunch clean through its carapace to savor the warmth within. He'd probably wipe his mouth, then make a quick phone call to the rest of the boys and tell them they could order one less pizza that night. This is what wielding a sword says about you. Well, if not you, it's what wielding a sword says about me. I find it unsurprising, the number of soldiers still in the nesting zone. Military masterminds on the outside are still pumping in batches of fresh recruits, even though they have no idea how many soldiers are alive or dead, or what's actually happening on the inside. Because no one's ever come back from the front lines. Not before I went in, and probably not after. Your first tour is your last and you expect that going in. Entering the battle zone is to enter the absolute unknown. Orbiting surveillance satellites explode if they gaze upon the nest. Planes, helicopters, and drones never return. Still, that doesn't stop people from lining up at the enlistment centers. Pop psychologists came up with all sorts of reasons why people wanted to join the war. Failing economy, declining birth rates, the allure of a final social media post that would forever bring one glory and honor throughout all subsequent ages of the internet, gilding one as a legend. But I think the soldiers come for a different reason to chase that certain hum you feel when you begin to realize you're dreaming. It's a note, a resonance of lazy tigers singing in the ribcage of a whale 
dead and bone white, atop some distant palace tower. If you were quiet, you could hear it emanate from the west coast of the United States, from a volcano in its upper left corner, trickled from the glaciers hugging the mountain slope, and the streams which flowed untamed through slanted fields of wildflower. <sighs> Summer at its finest. The nesting zone is surrounded by a 500-foot-tall hedge jungle. It regrows at visible speeds when damaged, not allowing for a single entry point to be established. Mist forms a haze above the canopy, the treetops often erupting with prehistoric palls of steam. Pillars of white cumulonimbus that raise sky-buckled exhaust venting from the vast and organic machine of extinction, crawled long and aching out from the well of time's tombless rage. Our nation's revered and autocratic sluglord emperor, I mean, president, ordered the military to patrol the exterior of the nest. They detained anyone trying to enter. Ended up shooting a few people, including a band of kids on tricycles. It made a big splash in the news, launched protests and riots. So, after six months, they gave up. There was no stopping the migration. Passengers with a one-way ticket to the greatest unknown to ever present itself on the face of the planet. People plunge into the titanic ring of bush on a daily basis. Sometimes with guns, backpacks, dirt bikes, and sometimes nothing at all. News channels can't even get an interview out of people about to enter. The magic of the nest is just too overwhelming. All this kind of footage shows is a human, alone, walking to a barrier wall of shrub and vine and frond, stepping into leaves that absorb them and then rapidly form orange fruit that grow in the shape of their body. I ate one before going in myself just two weeks after I bailed on basic training. Enough time to learn all their bullshit, overly complicated acronyms and how to fire the weapons I might find. The fruit? It tasted of tang and battery acid. Something only a Jurassic era, tar-gargling salamander could stomach. The nest barrier is thought to be a few miles thick, but everyone I've talked to saw a different landscape on their trek in. Terrains that seem to hark back to some crucial moment in their lives. For me, it was a wide marsh channel, reeds yellow and dry in a coastal October, clacking expectant in high wind and under a gray sky. In the distance, a body, slowly drifting out in the whirls and switchbacks of tidal maze, beckoning me further and further in. It was like being in a museum curated by Mother Nature, just for me, her whispering in my ear. My sweet, sweet child, I have seen the place you go beyond your death. That circle which all known stars have turned their backs upon. I have seen the shape of your hands there. Wild, screaming inward, past throngs of horror and miscreation toward the bulged lip at its center. 
that speckled balloon filled by your lust for forgotten treasures, and caving the sealed gate in God's heart, where a golden wolf guards the corpse of what was stolen from you. My progress the past few days has been slow. Just an uneventful belly crawl toward the next intersection node. Pleasant, you could say. I wiggled through trenches varying in height from three feet to thirty. I took my time. Chanced eating wild mushrooms. Looked through photos in dead soldiers' wallets and purses. Imagined how easily the families and pets they left behind forgot about them. Started hitting on bartenders. Took shits on freshly cut lawns and sniffed at the stars. Every few days, a battle fight breaks out. Automatic weapon fire popping against the extra-dimensional moons of megafauna. But you can't look. Because looking gets you interested, captivated, unable to tear your gaze from the splendor of a nightmare heaved and writhing in broad daylight. Come on, tell me, how close can you stare at the tip of a knife? How many milliliters of sun plasma can the insides of your eyes hold without sloshing? On the easy days, I entertain myself by reading messages scrawled in the mud. Soldiers smooth over grime on trench walls with their bayonets and then go about transcribing their thoughts. At first, these notes said things like, Go left, don't go right, or get good, like the war was some sort of video game. Often there were poems, descriptions of recently receded landscapes, incomprehensible babble about the end of some parade. I saw that one a lot, actually. A lot of talk about parades. Or things like, Jackson is a traitor. He stole my kit and left me to die. If he asks you for food, put your pack down. Make him look inside it so you can stab him in the neck and gouge out his peepers. Then do me a real good favor, friend and take a leak right in his face. For old Bucktooth Bill, rider of wild motorcycles, wilder men, and the one laid beside you as the dead, broken-legged motherfucker huddled in the fetal position. Hand over heart, I come across one of these messages before the upcoming intersection node. It reads, The whaler lies ahead, alive and well. Shit. No way. This is a surprise indeed. See, to the infantry and everyone else, the whaler is a legend. A simple fisherman from the coast a few hours west who got caught up in the nesting zone during the chameleon's emergence. High Command and the public know nothing about him, again, since no one's ever returned from the front lines. But within the nest, rumors are rampant. The whaler is one of the few who hold a witnessed, confirmed extermination. Full knockout. It happened a month after the nesting zone emerged, back when no one knew what the hell was going on. At the start of the war, 
before it was an actual war. The center of organized platoons simply flattened into puddles of blood without explanation. A single soldier bragging about questionable sexual exploits of a sudden might be ripped from the ground straight up into the blue of sky, gone forever. A helicopter tech handing you a cracker would stare in panic as their arm fell to the ground, severed from their body. The chameleons hadn't revealed their form yet, not until the whaler showed himself. There are varying accounts of the extermination, but this is what I've pieced together based on the overlap I've heard. Dawn Company was bunkered down in foxholes. They didn't know what else to do after watching five tanks crumple under the weight of a mystic gravity. One by one, a soldier would try to make it to a tank with someone trapped inside. After the rescuers spontaneously combusted, their white charred bodies remained upright, forming Pompeii exhibits in an ashen sculpture garden, birthed one human at a time. Then, a man in a yellow trench coat appeared from the tree line, beard of pure gray, hair kissed by gale force winds, chum and the gamey scent of oil. He carried two short gaffs on his waist and a sash of thick rope. Narrow, rusted, and barnacled, his harpoon towered, a pink flag tied just below the toggled barb. His steps were uneasy. The gait of a sailor fresh off a boat which had barely survived some great storm. He walked by all the soldiers crouched in their hidey holes, bent down to pet an inflatable parrot tied to the shoulder of a trembling private. The tanks burned as he passed them, but the whaler continued, unfazed, the epitome of not giving a fuck. Then, a monolith of blistered black rose from the ground the height of a bell tower, made of depthless obsidian, heat spewing from its obelisk edges in unseen gusts, embers swirling into a shape, the froth of magma spraying in wide fans to form lungs, a spleen, muscles, and taut scale. It was in this fashion the first chameleon revealed itself. Pure red. The red of hate and failed nations, and the color a lover might paint their nails to signify the sudden appearance of a rift in their heart, which could never be mended. The lizard crouched, hunched its back to display a heaving chest swollen with cataclysmic sunrise. A prominent head crest easily identified the species, Camellio caliptratus, a veiled chameleon. Soldiers who fired their weapons were instantly set aflame by the gaze of what we'd come to know as the first PCC. A pyromancer class chameleon, but the whaler held his ground, even as the chameleon lurched forward. Jaws split. Throat growled with a thousand rowboats, grating harsh and lonesome against oyster bed. Whaler dipped his harpoon tip into a glass jar filled with an unknown black substance. Then, with a throw to rival the trajectory of the most hollowed Olympic javelin, the whaler launched his harpoon, 
rope trailing, tip pointed and true. The weapon struck clean in the chameleon's protruding head cask. And the chameleon? It stilled, listed to its side, scale color on its flanks flushing from red to blue. The blue of waves and open ocean, a gradient which only appears at the intersection of sky and flat sea, where the horizon peels away and air and water become a passageway just wide enough for one to pass through. Puddles formed as the reptile evaporated, tail first into the air, into a perfect circle of surged waterfall. The whaler held onto his rope, rising with chameleon vertebra through the rapids into a spherical sea. The primordial womb where all oceans are born.